Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Joe Davich. I'm the executive director here at the Georgia Center for the Book. And on behalf of the Georgia Center for the Book and the DeKalb Hackman Public Library, welcome to our Poetry Atlanta event for the evening. I would like to thank all of you for coming this evening and inviting us into your homes. I know there is so much going on and so much going on in the world right now. We are just pleased that you've chosen to spend the evening with us, and we hope that you can sit back, relax, and enjoy the poetry. I'd also like to thank the DeKalb Library Foundation. They're the organization that has provided us with the Zoom account in order to do these virtual events due to the global pandemic. The DeKalb Library Foundation is, of course, the organization that's part of our library system that helps raise funds for programming that is not covered by the tax digest that we receive as a library. So our thousand books before kindergarten, a lot of the summertime craft programs that go along with summer reading, and of course, our Take the Internet Home program that provides internet for people who can't afford it or just don't have the ability to have it personally for in-home use. So thank you to the Cab Library Foundation for providing us with the technology this evening and for continuing to support our library systems. Speaking of support, if you would like to buy any of the poetry books this evening, our poets have suggested using Karis Books in more in downtown Decatur. They're an independent bookstore who's doing books by mail during this pandemic time. So you can find them at karisbooksandmore.com or feel free to give them a call and they will mail books out to you, whether it's the poetry books for this evening or any of the books that you select to order and they will happily do so. They are one of the nation's last and oldest feminist bookstores and they are truly deserving of our support. We'd also like to let you know the bookstores like Brave and Kind and Madhu that are black owned bookstores in the area. And we also suggest that you support these bookstores as well. So tonight, of course, is our Poetry Atlanta reading and it's our very favorite Poetry Atlanta reading known as Call and Response. Um, it always proves to be very, very fun. And we are so glad that Colin and Karen are here to do it this evening. Colin is of course, the editor of Atlanta In Town Magazine and he is the author of Render, Midnight in a Perfect World, and the Venus Trilogy of Novels. If you haven't read the novels, we suggest that you pick those up along with his poetry. And Karen is, of course, a professor at Georgia Tech. She is the editor of Atlanta Review and the author of Sassing, On Occasion, Four Poets, One Year, and quite famous for being the poet laureate of Waffle House. So, I think we're going to try and do a virtual coin toss here to see who's going to go first, because of course our format for the evening is one poet will read a poem and the other poem will respond to it in a timely fashion. That's what we're going for tonight. So if there is anyone who would like to go ahead and do a virtual coin toss and let us know whether Colin or Karen should go first, please hit the raise your hand feature and Allie will let us know if someone has done that. So I can be brave. <laughs> All right, do you have a coin? <laughs> Joe, you might have to do it. I have to do it? Yeah. I, I have a close. lens cap. <gasps> no. Wait, who is that? That was Colin. He's in the. He's. It's my Colin. He's in the. He's in the next room. He doesn't get to do it. <laughs> All right. I have a Cater Book Festival 2019 beverage ticket. <laughs> so that works. Heads will be the good for one beverage of choice, which is Karen. She raised her hand first. Colin, you're just the blank side, but that's right. okay. So, and the beverage ticket print side up. So that means Karen, do you choose to go first or pass? Um, no, we always have to. We always have to take it. But just before we do get started tonight, um, I wanted to take a moment um, and. Um, Say the following thing. Um, we, Colin and I both want to make sure that we are um, united in saying Black Lives Matter. And I want to read a list of names to you. Gwendolyn Brooks, Etheridge Knight, 
Lucille Clifton, Langston Hughes, Rita Dove, Terence Hayes, Allison Joseph, Kwame Dawes, Tracy K. Smith, Jericho Brown, Sharon Strange, Robert Hayden, Nikki Giovanni, Yusuf Kamanyaka, Natasha Trethaway, Kevin Young, Claudia Rankin, Saeed Jones, Teresa Davis, Ayadeli Heath, Camilla Moon, Carl Phillips, Patricia Smith. That's a pretty short list, but if you haven't ever read work by one of the people who I just named, or hopefully all of them, then I suggest, and Colin joins me, that you log off right now because you don't need to be listening to us. You need to be reading work by one of those writers. Um, so um, I will let you follow your heart on that. And okay. So um, Colin and I have been working on an anthology, which we're um, finishing up right now, that's going to come out later this year, called Mother Mary Come to Me. Um, and um, the money that is raised from that anthology is going to go to the uh, fund that helps rebuild um, the African American and Black churches, mostly in the South that have um, been uh, the, uh, that have been burned down. Um, and so um, we are finishing it up. It's gonna be great. The work is really stunning. So I'm gonna actually start with a Mary poem. And this is called Visiting the Black Virgin of Montserrat. The pilgrimage is not so difficult today. Metro, to train, to cable car, not even two hours, and we are 4,000 feet high. No clouds today. For lunch, we have bread and wine and ham. Just after the noon mass, we begin to queue, a line of the faithful and the merely interested. In front of me, a woman wears a tight snow leopard print mini dress and red stilettos. Her heels click a steady cadence. Her husband is ignoring her. Her language is Eastern European. She has traveled far. By the time we reach the virgin, the woman is weeping. Before we descend from the mountain, I stop to buy heather scented honey that I will smuggle through customs wedged deep inside a packed shoe. Well, that, that leaves me no choice but to read my <laughs> Mary poem, of course. So this is um, The Virgin Mary Appears in a Highway Underpass. Mary pops up in the strangest places, usually as a window stain or sandwich but yesterday she dripped down the wall of a Chicago underpass, brought the faithful running with candles and offerings, blocked traffic. I saw the pictures, couldn't see her face, saw a giant gaping vagina instead, just failed my Rorschach test, going to hell for short. If this is Mary, she sure gets around, recasting herself as a Holly Golightly, popping up where you least expect her, causing trouble for the locals. But why would she choose to appear in condensation, burnt toast, or ditch water runoff? Some will say it's proof that she still dwells here, runs like an undercurrent, manifests in the mundane. I say, cut the parlor tricks, Mary. If you want a little respect, come flaming out of the sky on a thundercloud, ride it like a magic carpet over middle America, Speak in a voice like Diana Rigg or Emma Thompson, command attention instead of this sleight of hand, a stain to be cleaned with soap and water so easily erased. All right, well, I think I'm gonna take as my uh, cue there, strong women saying what they think. 
listening to Michelle Obama denounce Donald Trump's abuse of women. Mid-October work conference in Denver, I'm just finishing one of those free breakfasts at a Hampton Inn, served on small round two low tables topped with cell phones and room key cards, thankful that the TV set is set to CNN and not Fox. Thankful that is until the man sitting next to me says to his friend, why does she always have to raise her voice, be so angry? Every woman around me shifts in her seat, except one. She is Native American. This is her country. She says loudly to her bouncer looking husband, go get me another biscuit. Something buried deep beneath my whiteness, maybe ancient marrow within the Cherokee cheekbones I inherited from great great grandmother Hester begins to leach out, surface. Jostling his table, his hot coffee, isn't hard with my woman's hips. Revolutions begin this way. Hmm. Mm. Okay. Mm. Of course, my computer, the, com the, the poem that I want, I can't seem to get to right now, of course. <laughs> um, hang on one second. Well, technical difficulties, of course. Well, while you're looking, I'll um, let any let some folks know in yeah, case they, they don't know. So Colin and I uh, sort of stumbled on this particular um, approach to doing readings one evening when, uh, as is sadly not that uncommon, uh, it was a, a terrible, terrible night. The weather was just god awful. And we were reading at Callenwald here in Atlanta. And um, one man showed up for the reading. And we, we didn't want to disappoint him, but it seemed sort of strange to stand at a podium and read to a single person. And so we just sort of started taking turns. And, um, you know, we've worked together as editors and as friends. And We've traveled together and read together in various parts of the world, and we both love to travel. Um, and so we know each other's work really well, and we kind of have kept doing this because it, it always makes the reading surprising for us. Even though we know each other's work so well, we never know how it's going to go. Um, so have you found your poem? I found my poem. Yay! <laughs> Yay. So... Carrying on from uh, strong women and also kind of a pop culture thing that we're working on. I'm working on a, I've been working on a series of poems about uh, women who were in silent films, who didn't have a voice and, or, and trying to give them a voice. So this is the first one that I wrote in that series and it's based on, uh, it's from the film, the 1928 film, The Wind, uh, starring Lillian Gish. And she played a character named Letty Mason. And so this poem is called, I Was Letty Mason. At first, I could only tell you in silent flickering images, title cards, round eyes, fists clenched against my teeth. Now that I've been given a voice, know this, he raped me and stayed the night as sand blew through the cracks. My husband was on the range rounding up the horses, but I didn't love him either. Once upon a time, I would have married Wirt Roddy, been his cattle baron bride, but the night he came to the Dust Bowl shack with his, when his fist on the door sounded like the wind knocking, I would have gladly taken my husband's calloused hands, bitten nails, and mangled declarations of love. In the morning, I shot Wirt and left him in a drift. Through the window, I watched a sandstorm bury and exhume his body over and over as the wind howled madness into me. Don't believe everything you see. I didn't magically fall in love with my husband and the barren land. I wandered into the desert to die. The Indians believed the north wind was a great white horse kicking and bucking the sky. 
when I finally tamed him, the grit filling my lungs and picking my bones clean, I was no longer afraid of anything. Oh, I hadn't heard that one yet. Yeah, it's a new one. Or kind of new. It's old for me, but new for you. Hmm. Finnegan's Lenox Square, 1987. Officially, it's our first date. The laughter easy, albeit a little agitated by Glenn Close's performance in Fatal Attraction. Maybe not the best choice for date night, you say. I'm 20, newly divorced and trying damn hard. Is there any other way? To seem sophisticated, buckled into your BMW cruising down Peachtree Street. We both know tonight is a sure thing. It's been a couple of weeks since you invited me over to your house, not really a home, no real furniture, just a waveless waterbed and some pillows on the living room floor where we fucked after watching Michael Jackson's new video, The Way You Make Me Feel. Because you are a dentist, my dentist, you knew that my ex abused me so you gave me a new toothbrush and gently put my contact lenses in the bowls of soup spoons filled with tap water. You let me stay the night. Tonight, amid a bar forest of ferns and brass, I will taste Grand Meunier for the first time, not realizing that the orange scent and the slight burn in my throat will, for the rest of my life, remind me what it means to be hysterical. Hmm. Oh, I have one. I have a response to that. I have one for that. Uh, also, uh, about uh, my misspent youth, this is called acid flashback number two. I'm transfixed in tower records, all the CD covers dancing like a thousand little TV screens, your whispers a remote control changing those flickering images. When security asks us to leave, you drive my car as I slump against the window. I close my eyes and transport a Star Trek style to the other side of the city. Blink once and we're back in the mall parking lot. These are the nights you love me best. We watch Jurassic Park in wide-eyed terror, cower on the front row, your nails dig into my palm, hold on for dear life, as if those giant Tyrannosaurus jaws might snatch us through the screen. We've already broken the rules of time and space tonight. Anything is possible. Could go a couple of ways with that one. Mm. Oh, that's tough. Well, while she, did you tell them we've been doing this for like eight years? No, no. Yes, we've been doing call and response now for about, she told you the story about how we got started with it, but that was eight years ago. So we've been doing this, uh, this little reading of ours here for, for a long time now. Okay. On being the only one of my circle not to watch Twin Peaks. Laura Palmer's death did not haunt me. She lurked only at the edges of my reality. No need for understanding who killed her or why or where. 
the Red Room, the Black Lodge, just places where I knew someone else's evil resides. Lynch's world, though, is familiar enough. I've accepted a turbulent ride with him down Mulholland, found myself willing to slip into whatever cloak of amnesia I could claim. I understand what he's about. Truth is, most of my friends, feet singed by bright, hot, blue television rays, were eager to share the heat, to tell the tale over and again. Everything I needed to learn about Twin Peaks swallowed past a lump in my throat with tequila and slices of cherry pie. All of us, most of our waking lives, dreamlike, are trying to keep a parallel distance because the real is always more surreal than the imagined because some beautiful child is always dead begging for us to hear her story. Yeah, Karen and I have both been in, uh, have both been in uh, a, a couple of anthologies that were edited by Ivy Alvarez. Uh, and so Ivy, if you're watching on the playback over there in, uh, in New Zealand, hello. Um, so riffing off the day, I could read my Twin Peaks poem uh, since we're on that David Lynch tip, but I'm going to read my Mulholland Drive poem instead since you mentioned that. Um, so if you haven't seen Twin Peaks or Mulholland Drive, David Lynch's famous um, series and film, I highly recommend them. This is called Go Somewhere With Me. I'd follow you until I split in two, two smiles in my good girl purse, one for nights at home riding you on the couch and another for your Hitchcock fantasy, fitted gray suit. I'm spunky and a little dangerous. I'm hardy Canadian stock, grown cold and in the dark, jitterbugging my way, no sweat, all the way to Los Angeles. Starlit dreams put in a box until I looked like someone else, unrecognizable making coffee or embarrassing bit parts. You've got the key in your bag. All it takes is one twist. Tell me what this opens, what comes out. This is the girl I never dreamt I would be. So the night you take me clubbing at 2 a.m. and the seizures come, shocking me out of this reverie that you will never love me, will leave me, Yorando. I will disappear into blue light, but we will never be done with each other because you are the dream I made real. And in those dark, deep river nights when no one else would listen, I told every little star. Thank you, Joe. <laughs> I missed it. What was he saying? I was looking at a little sign that said snap, snap, snap. Oh. <laughs> oh, that's great. Oh, that would be a great t-shirt, Joe. You should make those and sell them on Etsy. I agree. My Paris year trois, under the influence of Frank O'Hara and Damina Loy. Bruce Willis held the door for me at Chanel, a story that should stand on its own merits or lack thereof, except that later at dinner, after I regale everyone with my famous person story, Martina begins to discuss the beauty of Notre Dame, the church, not the woman, except it really is about the woman, because what we are questioning is spirituality itself. And I say, even a self-professed atheist should be moved. But Andrew hears even a sock-wearing atheist, and we laugh, except that there's an air of something unsaid, something perhaps about what it means to be moved. So Jay and Maria make a joke about Coco Vaughn always sounding pornographic, which we all agree, not being French, is appropriately French, except Coke is cock in our language the American sound being a large part of what seems illicit, which isn't the same as explicit, something we are all trying to be but failing to do, particularly exceptional when you consider that words are our vocation. 
if this were one century earlier, the men would escort us to our hotel, leave us alone with our prayers, head for Montmartre's Cabaret de Nantes, hold the door open for sin. Instead, I order another round of kir, thrust my right pinky into the candle flame, shake loose my hair, find any temptation entirely my own. Hmm. Now, I could read What Remained, which is the usual poem that I would <laughs> read in response to that, but I'm going to read something else, um, which has a Paris connection. Um, so this happens to be this month, June, is the 25th anniversary of my very first trip to London and Paris, which is what inspired my Venus trilogy of novels. And even before the novels started, there was a series of poems I'd written while I was in London and Paris um, that kind of became part of the novels as well. And this is one of them. Um, it's called Put Yourself in My Place. Ten years now, I want to say something real, something that puts that one moment in perspective, strips it to nonfiction, absolves you, unlike all the others I've crucified in words to cleanse myself. And like some tab tabloid cover story, you have disappeared, dropped out of airspace, off my long damaged radar. Maybe you knew all along those days in Paris when we were so close, you almost let yourself splinter, told me to stay near, that it was so easy to get lost in a crowd, to lose sight. Did you keep the poems I gave you that day in the restaurant parking lot? exchanging property like a divorce. Those small words, scratches at the surface, are nothing to the pages written over the last decade when I've deconstructed us and those weeks, put them back together, and yet the ending remains unhappy. I can't lie, can't send us floating along the Seine into the sunset. My primitive detective skills have sought you out, but maybe not hard enough Maybe keystrokes can't match old-fashioned gumshoe. If I can walk the walk, I'll create the talk. So maybe it will reach the corner where you are. Someone will turn and say, haven't you heard? And you'll find these words to transport you back to that first London morning when we sat on a cold stone floor in a hotel lobby at 9 a.m. Out of our heads, out of this world, you held out a hand, then the fireworks. Uh, just want to give a shout out. I see Bob Cummings here with us this evening at, up in Tennessee, um, the publisher of my newest collection, Lost on Purpose. Good to see you sitting there, Bob. Um, so do I go? So do I go to? Do I go to England? This is the question. Mm -hmm. Well, I think I'll go with this one because this is a poem about uh, poets um, doing what they will with their work and then sometimes changing their minds about what they want to do with it. Um, and a place that we both really loved. At the Albion Beatnik Bookstore, Oxford, 2011. Dennis has just insisted I have a piece of week old sponge cake. It'll go off any minute. The strawberry filling is a little too red, but I love his shop. And as I take the first dry bite, I hear a young man, a student in literature, the Derrida, a dead giveaway, say to an obviously smitten girl, all poets are whores. The scent of bergamot in my tea starts to soften my scowl, and I notice Rossetti's The House of Life wedged in the corner of the bottom shelf. As I pull out the volume, I think, really? All poets are thieves. Dante, I cannot blame you for wanting to repossess the poems, even if it meant disturbing Lizzie in her Highgate grave. 
You fed on her day and night to fuel your own fantasies, but wanting to take back your words does not mean you loved her less. It's not the muse's place to possess the art. What I cannot forgive is your cowardice, sending Charles to her grave. It should have been you who pulled the worm-fed leaves from her tangled copper hair. Hmm. Okay, so let's stay on that Oxford thing then. Uh, since we were there together in Oxford, and since Colin's on the uh, on the uh, on the line here too, uh, this is called the Turf, which is a very famous pub in Oxford. The Turf, under the Bridge of Sighs, down Hell's Passage, it already sounds like a fairy tale. But soon I'm sitting at a table, a half pint of bitter in hand under a golden Oxford sky, and I am inhaling big lung buckets full of summer twilight air. I left on the 4th of July my middle finger to the colon colonies as I returned to the motherland. Tread the familiar airport floors, dozed on the coach, fell across an unfamiliar bed, yet feeling unarrived, unwowed, unspectacularized, until I am sitting with an Englishman and his wife, my friends, at the turf, this tiny pub hidden behind ancient walls where scholars and comet spotters drank themselves to genius, where our former president smoked pot. Only then do I feel that spark when jet-lagged, queasy stomach unclenches and this country embraces me again and I exhale deeply. Decisions, decisions. Unmute yourself. Unmute. Sorry, I, there was a uh, there was noise in the background, so I muted. Um, don't cry, Colin. Augury. In visions like contrails across the clouds of your grief, the dead visit you, albeit on their terms. Your father coming to you within a week, wanting to deliver you to a peaceful place. Your mother making you wait nearly a year of keeping you holding on the line. I'm not of your blood, but as the granddaughter of a conjure woman, I know certain things. I know that we are family. This and a love that can only spring from deliberateness will bring me to you quickly because I will be eager to tell you everything. It will happen on the Daru staircase in the shadow of winged victory, our constant Parisian archangel ready to steer us across the leaf. I do love that. So I should read the poem that inspired that poem for you, or one of them. In the afterlife, my father is a London cab driver. The hotel concierge gestures toward the waiting taxi, its back door already open. I slide in, say good morning, my, oh, I slide in, say good morning, and an American voice speaks back. Unmistakably, my father, dead three days, smiling at me in the rearview mirror as he pulls into traffic on Bayswater Road. There's no destination, so we'll make a loop around Hyde Park, long enough for him to tell me to be happy, healthy, and wise, to not give up on the dream of really being here when I wake. Leave it to daddy-o to leave it this way, to 
meet me on beloved ground he'd only heard about from my stories or watched on TV. When I think of my father now, he will always be in London, not gasping like a fish in a hospital bed as his heart went still. His new chosen profession, to ferry the living between the stations of their grief, jovially tipping his cap as he drops fares at the corner of the rest of their lives. Flight. The flash of color, green, sometimes blue, swishes from tree to tree, and you find it hard to convince yourself you've seen anything. Away from the busy streets, a colony of monk parakeets dazzle amid the laden orange trees at Pedrable's monastery. In this place, belief comes easy. Mornings, if you walk up Passage de Gracia, the windows of Grand Modernisme apartments thrown open wide, you imagine the flutter of escaping wings. You almost see the ghost of a grandmother scanning the skies, cursing sons and daughters and grandchildren who lacked devotion, who left the cage door open when she died. In the shadow of Tibidabo, where tradition holds the devil told Jesus all these things could be his, the mountains, the sea, these beautiful birds, I recite a prayer of hope, knowing that once I am gone, it will be hard to believe in what I cannot see. Mm, okay, all right, all right, let's see. I gotta look this one up. Mm, why is it not showing up? Huh. Ah, here we go. Okay. So since we're talking about grandmothers, this is called Why My Grandmother Lives in a Lantern. Because she didn't want a boring urn or to be scattered to the wind or buried like a campfire. Because I was trusted with her beloved son's remains and he resides in a fashionable vase befitting his impeccable taste. Where do you put a woman who has lived so many lives? who survived religious fanatic parents, a drunken, abusive husband, an impossible daughter, illnesses that should have killed her long before cancer at 89, who cleaned houses, motel rooms, hospital beds, washed others' clothes to make ends meet, who loved to go honky-tonking, drive cross-country, take up with younger men, answered to the nickname Moom Moom, who, after the diagnosis, pragmatically planned her own funeral to the letter, except this one thing, who said, leave me in the plastic crematorium box until you find the right place. And it sat for days on my coffee table, a monolith, as I awaited a message. Then I stubbed my toe on the iron lantern that had been sitting next to my door for two decades, always empty and in search of purpose without light. I turned the lantern on its side, opened its hinged door, set the bag of ash and bone atop, atop the dark opening. After a moment, the bag quivered and slipped inside like sand passing through the neck of an hourglass, home at last and decidedly unboring. Sometimes, when the evening light is just right and dances across the floor, it catches the lantern just so, and Moo Moo glows inside. Mm. <clears throat> because as vessels go, I can think of nothing more appropriate than being a guardian against darkness. I I'm verklempt. Talk amongst you. You are. <laughs> I'll 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 go to the obvious, but 
um, perhaps lift this up a little. Okay. Even though it won't sound like it at first. Instructions for my burial clothes. Sometimes I dream Dolly Parton is my aunt. I'm about 12. She comes to visit at Easter, brings me chocolates, jelly beans, and makeup. My mother frowns, hurries around the kitchen with other female relatives. They are all wearing sackcloth. Dolly sits beside me, plays a guitar, and sings. Her long, red, glittered nails click against the frets. When I say, do not bury me in a suit, I want to go out in sequins, my mother shakes her head, wonders where I learned such excess. Mm. Oh, I don't know what I'm going to follow that up with. Are, are we at the end here? We're at 745. So just be, should we do one last poll? Well, you, you have to go last because I started. Oh, well, then I should do something really to uplift, something sexy and fun. How about that? <laughs> so, well, there's nothing more sexy and fun than Dolly. That's true. Well, then she'd probably like this poem. Then. And it kind of takes us back to uh, where we started uh, the evening. Um, this is called Ritual. Jesus taps me lightly on the back, pokes my neck, catches in my hair. Sometimes he slides down my cheek, threatens to put out an eye, hangs suspended on his cross over my lips. Sometimes I catch his toes with my teeth or open my mouth wide and take him whole, a sacrament the cold metal sweet with sweat where it is laying on your chest all day. Sometimes Jesus just watches me from a distance, a tiny shadow at the center of your bare back as you sit on the edge of my bed ready to leave. And sometimes when Jesus disappears over your shoulder as you pull on your shirt, I confess that I want you to stay. As night turns into morning, glorious to luminous. Come back to bed and let's go through the mysteries of the cross once more. Yay. Yay. Thank you everybody for listening yes. in tonight. And thank you to Joe and Allie and Georgia Center for the book for always being such gracious hosts and for all of you listening in tonight as well. It was yes. uh, great hear, hearing you read. Uh, it's been, you know, I haven't ever had the opportunity before. I have to put up with a 91-year-old who is suffering from multiple maladies and spent the entire day trying to write. It's a big chore for a guy like me. It's good to meet you both. Thank you for being here. We really appreciate it. Yeah. We're getting a good lot see of you, Bob. Out, of, out of Georgia these days. Got a lot of really good books from, from that state. And I guess they've got a lot of uh, COVID-19 as well. But, <laughs> but anyway, it's really nice. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you so very much. You can order Lost on Purpose, as well as Karen's other books, In the Perfect World, Render from KarisBooksAndMore.com, or feel free to give them a call at 404-524-0304. I believe they're open from 10 a.m. till 4 p.m. to take those orders. So thank you all so much for coming. And Karen and Colin, that wonderful list you have, maybe you could send it our way and we can go ahead and post that as a reading list for everyone as well on right. our social yeah. medias. Right, I so, do. All right. Thank, thank you. you all again. Good night. Good night.